everybody, welcome. I'm your MC for the afternoon. I'm Jesse Adcock and I'm the Chief Technology Officer for the City of Vancouver. I'd like to welcome everybody here, local and visitors. It's great to have all of you. Um, I hope you enjoyed the networking lunch that was presented by Rio Tinto. Um, now, welcome to the afternoon session on how big data and IoT are creating a smarter global economy. Um, we have some pretty great speakers lined up for you this afternoon and I'm looking forward to all of these discussions. So we're starting with smart cities, which is my passion and what I spend most of my time doing right now. We'll look at how technologies are transforming how we live, how we work, how we do business, how we make decisions. This will be followed by a discussion on the Internet of Things. If you're not entirely sure what IoT is, you'll find out by the end of the afternoon. We've got experts that are going to help us learn all about IoT. We're also going to hear a viewpoint about big data and IoT from one of the province's most influential organizations, BC Hydro, and then perspectives from a telecommunications company in rural BC. Session two is about big data and the emerging algorithm economy. Session three, we'll look at satellite data. And then we'll finish with the BC government's data visualization challenge, including lightning pitches from the five finalists. Uh, I don't know if you've downloaded the app, but you can certainly see more of what's ahead in the app and learn about the speakers and get some bios regarding uh, their backgrounds. And if you haven't already, please check in uh, to this session through your mobile app. It helps us understand how to deliver better content to you. Uh, some of our presenters may ask you to provide feedback through the app, so that also helps us make it more interactive and you get more out of it. We've got a lot of ground to cover, so let's get started. Uh, we're going to begin with the topic of smart cities, and joining me now to discuss what exactly a smart city is and what innovative thinking is leading the way is the former Chief Technology Officer of the City of New York, now with Perfect, Future Perfect Ventures, Minerva Tantoko. We both get lots of questions around what is a smart city. Um, I've heard so many definitions, and the definitions have evolved while I've worked in the profession myself. I started off as the city's chief digital officer, and now I'm their chief technology officer. But I'm interested um, in terms of what you think it might be. We both come from private sector backgrounds, and we were brought into public sector to lead some heavy duty transformations. So how do you define smart city? Yeah, I think for, uh, hi everybody. Um, thanks again for having me here in this beautiful city of Vancouver. My first time here, Yay. and it's fantastic. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, coming from New York City, it really is a huge place, and in brief, for us, it, a smart city can't be a smart city without also being an equitable city. So actually, our smart city strategy was called Smart Plus Equitable City, with the idea that uh, tech, it's not just about the technology, it's about the humans and making the lives of everyday New Yorkers better. Yeah, so what I find is actually that it's a spectrum depending on which part of the landscape you're in. So one of the common themes that I see evolving is how it's not just about the city or the business or the government, that it's actually an ecosystem that gives rise to innovation. And if we read about the culture of cities and how more and more people are living in cities, it's um, those cities which have that innovation ecosystem that really seem to thrive the most. Um, would you agree that that, that that is, you know, the case in New York and other cities you've traveled to globally? Sure, absolutely. It's really uh, a, a huge uh, component to be part of the eco ecosystem. And I think some of the most successful projects that we worked on in the city of New York were public-private partnerships they were based on pilots and prototypes and actively engaging the residents of New York as part of the innovation lab. Basically thinking of the city of New York as uh, a living lab for some of our smart city initiatives. I just want to pause and, and give you folks a, a little bit of a, a sense of the size of New York City. Um, the annual operating budget is $82.1 billion uh, per year. We have 36,000 police officers. That's um, larger than most standing armies. The number of school children is 1.1 million. Uh, and that's just public school children. It doesn't include you know, the private schools. Um, so uh, with over 325,000 uh, city employees, um, New York City is the largest employer of New Yorkers, actually, um, by percentage. Um, and if you include contractors, 
one in eight people that you will run into, working people in New York, work for the city of New York in one way or another. So just the vastness of the, this means that you know, the kinds of strategies have to be really all-encompassing and take into account just the huge variety of people, uh, income levels, uh, locations, and it, it's, it, was a, it was, would be a daunting task, but, um, <laughs> but we managed to come up with an approach that you know, provided guidelines for, for um, the over 50 agencies that run the city. Yeah, it's an interesting point you bring up, actually, because even the city of Vancouver, which is nowhere near as big as New York, but by Canadian standards we, and Metro Vancouver standards, we're the largest employer in Metro Vancouver. Mm -hmm. We have a very, very um, evolving role to play in the innovation ecosystem. We have, in the summer, the most number of employees of any other organization in the city. Um, and, and we're very new. Like We're evolving mm. a lot of technology that's being developed within the confines of Metro. Um, we have to look at ways to nurture and foster that growth so we can continue to have a strong economy. So the role the city plays is really evolving from that traditional structure that I think most people are used to, to playing more of an active role in, in innovation and economic development. I think New York has really taken the lead on that though, uh, in the sense that not only were you guys larger, but you guys are also the ones who sort of connect the dots sooner rather than later. So for example, with IoT, a lot of the IoT devices and the data being generated and the sensors being deployed are being deployed within the confines of the city. And so oftentimes we have to think about, well, how do we manage the, the sensors and the various devices being deployed that are connected to the internet? Um, and you guys led the charge on this, so tell me a little about what, what you did in New York City for that. Sure, very, very exciting stuff. So one of the very first projects was um, the franchise for the payphones was coming up for renewal. And um, I, I did not want my first act as CTO of New York to be renewing a, a contract for payphones. <laughs> um, that seemed very last century. So um, uh, as a result of an RFP, we selected a company called Link NYC, and every one of those payphones is going to be a free Wi-Fi hotspot with free phone calls available. Um, and it's paid for by digital advertising. Another project was a smart park bench, which would let us count how many people use that park at what times of the day. So the beginning of using Internet of Things, meaning you know pay phones, and park benches, got us to thinking that there really are no guidelines for this. When, when you buy um, a light bulb as a city government, that's one type of contract. When you buy a city, a smart light bulb, that's a totally different kind of contract. And so we started to talk about, well, is there a privacy policy for the park bench? We've never had a privacy policy for park benches before. And so that's out of exactly this... That's the kind of stuff that's coming up, right? Exactly, that's never exactly. never even been looked at or thought about. That's correct. And so we came up with the idea to develop a set of guidelines for the city agencies themselves. What kinds of things do you need to look for in the contract? What sort of maintenance agreements and operations, sustainability, privacy, security, you know? Um, and so those became the impetus for creating the Internet of Things guidelines. And through that process, where we talked to everyone from IBM to the ACLU, several other city governments, we created a set of uh, city guidelines that we would share with uh, vendor partners as well as other cities. And, um, and it's now available to the public, nyc.gov slash IOT. I'm happy to say that you know, over 20 cities have actually signed on in support of these IOT guidelines, including the yeah. wonderful city of Vancouver. We just signed on, yeah. So that's great, thank you. Yeah, it's really interesting actually. A couple of years back we had this case where we were trying to refresh the rules around um, telecommunications and other companies attaching different devices to our light poles in the city. And we were trying to envision what the future uses of it were. So we had this brainstorming session as we were trying to update our policy. And we, we were going to the extent, and Amazon had just done that first video talking about drones. And so a few of us sort of sat down and said, well, you know, one of the potential future uses could extend beyond telecommunications companies and could involve, and this was like totally pie in the sky two years ago, but we thought, they're eventually going to need to dock the drones somewhere to charge the drones. And we, um, we talked about that. We looked at like different use cases and developed what we thought were far out use cases. And just a couple of weeks ago, Amazon put in a patent for exactly that thing that we had envisioned may or may not happen. And so, um, I mean, the, the visions that we're having around 
how the technology is moving um, really converges within the city. That's right. I think you know um, it, it's it's a an evolution that isn't just vendor led or resident led. I think as particularly muni municipalities have a seat at the table to help work with um, new technology companies to develop the policies together. And that's really, really important, you know, in terms of public safety and security, as well as how do we use the technology to benefit all the residents of a city? And that's part of the equitable city component, to put some of the best technology in the areas of the city where it might do the most good. Um, uh, if I can give you a couple examples, uh, you know, one is the um, traffic signal prioritization project, which actually started out as a pilot that um, when it sees a public uh, bus go by, it'll prioritize the bus through some of the most congested parts in Midtown. And we found that on those bus routes where we employed traffic signal prior prioritization, which connected the traffic lights with the, um, with the sensor on the bus, 20% savings in commute times on public transportation. So that makes everybody's life better, encourages public transport. The shot spotter system is a um, sound sensor system that actually detects gunshots, and it can triangulate and very uh, closely pinpoint the origin of, of, of where the gunfire occurred and immediately alert the um, nearest precinct. And you know, we found there that 72% um, of those detected gunshots um, were not reported to 911. And so it was really improved the safety of some of the most dangerous areas of the city. So those are some examples of how you can really use technology to make the lives of residents much better. Yeah, no kidding. So that also, I mean, in, is indicative of why I think cities are creating sort of larger portfolios based around digital and technology. So I came to the city originally to manage a four-year digital strategy to transform the culture of the city, and I was their chief digital officer. And then I recently took over the technology portfolio. My background, though, was um, like yourself, mm. banking uh, and telecommunications before that, and had not worked in government. And similarly, I think you, you also had that same path. So what do you think it is that is causing um, various government bodies to now look outside for leadership? Well, you know, I think it's a wonderful trend that there are a growing number of CTOs in government roles. As technology takes up more and more of our lives, our everyday lives, we're, we, we can use that opportunity to empower citizens and governments to really use technology to, to make lives better. And, and the role of the CTO is evolving and is different for each city, it's unique yeah to every municipality. There are many commonalities like sharing data and you know, improving technology infrastructure. It's also but, extending external now with, with economic development goals and, and right. things that help make the innovation ecosystem or the startup ecosystem around us develop even better. That's absolutely right. And, and I love the work that you're doing with the sort of developing tech talent. Um, in New York City, we created the tech talent pipeline as well and computer science for all for public school children. And this was especially important for me, leaving private sector for 30 years, CTO at a couple of banks like Merrill Lynch and UBS. Um, and it was especially important to me because I, w my family came to New York City. We we're New Yorkers, but we came as immigrants. I went to all New York City public schools. And I grew up to become the first CTO of New York. That's and cool. you know the future CTOs of, of the cities are out there. So I'm going to read a quote from Gartner, because I, I think it's topical for the rest of the afternoon. But Gartner predicts, or Gartner's research predicts, that half of citizens in million people cities will benefit from smart city programs by voluntarily sharing their personal data. This is by, sorry, 2019. So the volume and the diversity of information generated by citizens will continue to rise in line with the proliferation of customer devices and Internet of Things. So we know that the Internet of Things is going to reach billions and billions in the same amount of time. So people are connecting these devices, their toys, their appliances, their televisions, everything to the Internet. And now they're becoming more and more likely to understand the value of that personal data. And, and, and the prediction is all around 
essentially citizens realizing the value of that data and then using that data as currency to try and derive value from consumers and from governments. So do you think that that's going to happen? And if that's going to happen, how do you kind of see that unfolding? Yeah, it's an excellent, excellent question because what's, what's happening now, you know, uh, that we didn't have 30 years ago is the explosion of data that's out there. And I think we need a very mindful approach to what is the data ecosystem, who owns it, who can use it, reuse it, sell it, um, and how can we as both uh, residents and you know, private human beings, um, while we walk out in the city streets, we're kind of leaving a trail of data wherever we go with your phone and with your watch. And so I think you know, there isn't any one answer. I think what's evolving is this kind of approach where there is a shared interest in gathering, uh, say, foot traffic patterns, and you know you can contribute to that, um, but also to maintain the uh, the privacy of the individuals themselves. And so, if we can all benefit without, uh, it, it, it's it's going to be very interesting to see where the balance between privacy, security, and the benefits of having all this amazing data available. One approach is in New York City is the you know, open data law. And so any of the data that's collected by city agencies by law must be made public on a, on a public open data portal for use by anyone. And so that's one way, I think, to help equalize and democratize the access to the data that's being collected on city streets. So on that note, um, I think we've laid the foundation for this new connected ecosystem. And so what we're going to hear for the rest of the afternoon is the various players in that ecosystem. And so thank you, Minerva, for making the time for us. Thank really you. Really appreciate you flying down here. I think this was, uh, for me, it was a great opportunity to talk to, well, one of the first people who created the role. So thank you for that. Great. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. Light makes everything brighter. It helps us see possibilities. It shows us the way. A beam of light is revolutionizing healthcare in Canada. It's empowering kids to imagine and create, helping businesses compete globally while keeping jobs local, and giving families the number one internet technology for speed and reliability with equal download and upload capabilities to connect like never before. This beam of light has arrived in your neighborhood Right now, TELUS is investing in Canada, connecting homes and businesses with tiny glass fibers that transmit information at the speed of light. It's linking patients to their doctors, pharmacists, and extended care teams instantly, helping reduce wait times, consolidate records, and provide better health outcomes for Canadians. It's preparing students for the future by putting world-class educational tools and the latest interactive technology in the hands of teachers everywhere. It's leveling the playing field for local businesses, allowing them to keep pace with global markets as their employees work from home, increase their productivity, and reduce their carbon footprint. We're doing it by putting communities first, partnering with local leaders to plan a fiber network that's good for all of us. This beam of light is bringing communities together to celebrate a future of possibilities for Canadian families. Experience the power of the TELUS Pure Fiber Network. My name is Doug Sage. I'm a director of marketing with TELUS on the Pure Fiber program. And I'm going to elaborate a little bit on that beam of light and what it means to British Columbians and how that beam of light will change the way we work, live, socialize, and raise our families in the digital world. Now, as you saw in that short video clip, TELUS is investing in the future of Canadians, advancing Canada's place in the world by laying the foundation for future growth and development. Why? Because TELUS is determined to improve the lives of Canadians through technology and advanced healthcare. How? By connecting Canadians to the global market through a fiber to the premise network build. Now at the heart of it, a fiber build is an infrastructure upgrade. It's the evolution of the connected home, the connected business. Now, over a century ago, society started to connect the home to the greater community. Electricity, running water, the first copper telephone networks, and so on. As society's need to connect continues to expand, 
You can think of fiber to the premise as the next wave in the evolution of the household infrastructure. In the mid-80s, early 90s, those first digital subscriber lines, those DSL networks, were built over copper networks that had originally been built for voice nearly a century ago. Now, at the time, global data consumption amounted to a mere 33 gigabytes per month. A decade later, with a 12,000-fold increase in data consumption, original copper networks reached limits of capacity. And with broadband builds and fiber to the node in widespread deployment, 2015 saw 72 exabytes of data consumption per month globally. And demand just keeps growing. By 2020, the globe will be churning through 203 exabytes of data per month. That's 18 zeros. Fiber optics, that's the next wave of the connected premise. That's the beam of light. That's how supply is going to catch up to that demand. Delivering speeds today in Western Canada of 250 megabits per second. By 2020, we'll see gigabit technology delivering 20 gig. And because, because, um, because fiber reaches so deeply into the network via fiber to the premise, it will provide a, a vital terrestrial backhaul for the advent of 5G wireless technology. And it's made of glass, so it's resilient to weather and more reliable than copper networks. Built upon dedicated paths, not a shared neighborhood loop like coax, so in the evening, your signal won't degrade when network congestion is the highest. So what's driving all this demand? Well, have you recently, by mistake, turned on a standard deaf TV program? Or worse, a hockey game in standard deaf? We, we've come to expect the quality of high deaf. Just as a few years ago, standard deaf was just fine. And now, 4K TV is here, and it is slick, it's clear. And a few years from now, we'll normalize 4K quality the way we do HD today. But all that goodness in 4K video quality comes with a cost, a cost in bandwidth. You see, video streaming is a network hog. It comes, uh, uh, internet video traffic accounts for 69% of all consumer internet traffic. That's up from 57% in 2012. And where is this going next? Well. You've already seen it in telepresence. You can see it in uh, virtual reality. It's, it's the conundrum of our era. Bandwidth drives innovation, and in turn, innovation drives an even greater demand for bandwidth. The limits of innovation are bound only by our imagination. We know, projecting today's growth rates, that tomorrow we'll need the bandwidth fiber offers. Here's how we benefit today. Businesses. You can take advantage of cloud computing through symmetric internet connectivity. That means uploading your large files the same speed as you download them, safely stored in facilities like the $75 million uh, internet data center in Kamloops. Home-based businesses and startups now have access to the same speeds, functionality, reach, security, and privacy that established companies currently enjoy at a fraction of the cost compared to just a few years ago. New businesses create employment. This attracts knowledge workers. Growth drives further innovation. Fiber provides unprecedented educational opportunities, enabling distance learning, the ability to reduce print costs, and keep curriculum up to date. Imagine, imagine the impact of small towns where fiber-connected students can attend online courses from the best institutions in the world at much lower cost. The annual cost of supporting an on-campus student versus off-campus is five to 15 times greater. A connected community means more British Columbians can access education and stay, live, and thrive in their hometowns. It's a future generation of homegrown knowledge workers in, in some small town, maybe not so close to here. Companies can attract and retain the best, employee, the best employees by enabling telecommuting uh, it's a significant driver of engagement. At, at TELUS, we have a program we call Work Styles, where 60% of workers either work from a flexible office location or work from home. Employers benefit uh, by reducing travel costs and leveraging high-def video uh, and are able to reduce, significantly reduce real estate needs. And employees cut wasteful commuting time, spending more time in their lives outside of work. It, it, it wouldn't impact lifestyle. Wouldn't impact to working families, to the ability to manage around family activities, an impact to health, to, to relationships, and in congested cities, to, to air quality. 
we're all familiar with the narrative around Canada's looming healthcare crisis where 15 years from now, 25% of all Canadians will be 65 or older, or that 40% of prescriptions handwritten contain errors, or maybe that uh, close to 50% of patients don't take their med medication adequately. At TELUS, we see a role in this. We see that with more accurate, secure capture, storage, and sharing of information via technology and a collaborative health ecosystem, we can make a mark in achieving better patient experiences and measurable health outcomes. We've made demonstrable inroads in this journey through investments in electronic medical records, telemedicine, electronic referrals, and prescription. All this is underpinned by interconnectivity, and that's where fiber comes into the picture. Mia's gonna talk about IoT in a moment and how it will unlock new revenue sources and reduce costs, but when you put it all together, cloud services, virtual classrooms, flexible workspaces, telemedicine, distance from the hub matters less. Whether it's Kettle Valley, Nicola Valley, Comox Valley, Silicon's just another valley, and maybe, maybe Creston is where startups start to thrive. Or in Vancouver, we can stop obsessing over real estate prices and move to Revelstoke. Now just uh, time for a quick update on the, pros uh, on the progress of our pure fiber build across BC. By the end of 2017, uh, TELUS will have invested close to $1.3 billion in bringing pure fiber directly to nearly half a million homes in 40 businesses and communities, pardon me, 40 communities across BC. Now we're, we're up the Sunshine Coast, all the way from Gibsons to Powell River, along the entire corridor of the Okanagan, from a Soyuz all the way to Armstrong, from Fernie to Fort St. John, from Terrace to Tofino and Victoria all the way up to Campbell River. And we're filling up the GVRD as well with current builds in Vancouver proper, recent announcements in Surrey and Burnaby, builds in Poco, White Rock, Abbotsford and Mission. And as our discussions with the rest of BC Munis progress, you can follow our progress at fiber.telus.com slash community name. And we've got a lot done, there's a lot more to do. But forgive us in advance, I'll say, we're probably going to block traffic in your neighborhood, maybe tear up a few roads, maybe a few front lawns will be disrupted. Forgive us for this mess. There's a reason why we only do this once a century, but I promise it'll be worth it. And now Mia is going to take over and talk about how we take this foundation and on top build an IoT world. Mia? Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Good afternoon, everyone. So I am thrilled to be here today and talk to you about IoT. So we all know that IoT delivers meaningful efficiencies. So it increases productivity, it gives insights into operations that we didn't necessarily have before, and it increases profit, and that translate, it can translate into a better customer experience. I'm gonna talk about a few examples on some of these solutions, but before I do that, I wanted to give you a bit of a sense where IoT adoption is in Canada. And in a couple of studies, one of the studies told us that there were about 15% of organizations that have adopted IoT solutions today in Canada. And there's another 30 to 35% that are thinking that they will look at deploying a solution over the course of the next 24 months. We also did another study uh, with a partner of ours and we polled 1,500 companies. And out of those 1,500 companies, 18% were either piloting a solution or deploy, had deployed a solution. But the interesting stat that came out of that was out of that 18%, 80, out of that 18%, there was an 86% level of satisfaction in the solution that they deployed. And they were looking at look, bringing other solutions within their organizations to help them to continue with digital transformation. So, we were talking earlier, in the earlier presentations, we were talking about smart cities. And as mentioned, smart cities can mean a lot of different things. And so I wanted to talk about different examples of smart cities and really what it means to the citizens, to the municipalities, and different components within a smart city. So first, what's a connected city? It's really the services that a municipality is going to give to their citizens. And part of that, an example of that is having uh, the municipality having line of sight into all of their water transmission pipes and being able to identify a leak before it bursts. If there is a critical burst in one of these transition pipes, the average cost to replace a mile of it costs over a million dollars. And the impact to citizens is disruption in service for days and days. And that is critical for a city to ensure that these things don't happen. 
especially when a tie at a time where temperatures are fluctuating, having line of sight can have a critical impact on your budget. Another example of a connected city is at, in terms of if you have all of your assets, where are all of your assets, where are all of your vehicles and your fleets? And you know, could you imagine living in a city where you would know if your garbage has been picked up or if the snow removal has been done on your street? Now, I'm based out of Toronto, but I understand that here in Vancouver that might have come in handy in the last couple of weeks. And so being a citizen and being having access to that type of information can transform and has an impact on your day-to-day -day life. And in talking to a lot of the cities, one of the things that they talk to us is, and one of the things we work to solve with them is, how do you drive more engagement with your citizens? So how do you make sure that as a citizen you can communicate, and as a taxpayer, how do you have line of sight into what your city is doing with your tax dollars? Could you imagine having the ability to be able to have a say on how your tax dollars are being spent? If you live within a particular neighborhood and they're thinking of maybe uh, implementing a playground or maybe they should have a park, well maybe the city having access to the demographics and the people who live in the area, you could have access to a poll via an application and you would be able to vote on what would happen. That would give you direct impact, direct insight and impact into the decisions that are made that affect your life. Other examples and a component of a smart city are smart buildings. And so a lot of the smart building solutions out there are all about energy management. How do you reduce your overall energy management? And today in North America, whether commercial or private, 40% of energy consumption comes from buildings. So there's a lot of solutions that can help in terms of decreasing that, but our customers are also, and solutions are becoming more sophisticated. And not only do you want to decrease your costs but you want, from an energy management perspective, but you want to be able to know how your spaces are being used, how many meeting rooms are being used, what the peak time is, and how do you ensure that your real estate is being maximized in terms of usage. And if we extend a smart building to another type of smart building in a smart city, we can think of a connected hospital. So it may sound cold, but at the end of the day, hospitals look to get people in and out very quickly, as efficiently and as safely as possible. And so how can they do that? Having different solutions that can give them line of sight into where all of their assets are, where all of their people are, and taking that data and being able to operationalize and maximize their operations by seeing what's going on within their hospital. And if you've ever been to a hospital, sometimes it can be a very daunting experience. You may not necessarily which door, you may not necessarily know which door to go in. You may not necessarily know where you should be going to. So could you imagine going to a hospital and having a wayfinding application on your phone that can give you turn-by-turn -turn directions? That can translate into a more positive experience. But also for the hospital, if you add up every single time that an employee gives turn-by-turn -turn directions and you add that up over the course of a year, that can mean a lot of, pro of lost productivity for them for the hospital. So we can talk about, I wanted to give a different flavor in terms of the different types of solutions. So we've talked about smart cities, but what do citizens like to do in, city, in cities? One of the things they like to do is they like to eat. And if you are going to a restaurant and really understanding, you know, and we've been talking a lot about the term farm to table, how do you ensure that your food getting from the source of origin to the restaurant to the client, how do you ensure that that's done efficiently? So there are a couple of solutions that can help. If you're a restauranter or a producer and you have a fleet of trucks, you want to be able to know where all of your vehicles are. You want to be able to know their idling time, their gas consumption, and you want to be able to have line of sight into predictive maintenance. That impacts your bottom line, and that impacts your overall product, your profitability. But also, the assets that you're transferring, so the food that is being moved from one location to another, how do you ensure that that stays safe? So having a cold chain food monitoring solution that enables you to monitor that and identify if any asset or any food has been compromised ensures that you're not going to have a bad customer experience amongst potential health concerns, but you're also ensuring a consistent experience and customer satisfaction. So it has a positive impact not only to the people who are producing, but it also has a positive impact to the consumers. And if we go back to Doug's presentation earlier, and we were talking about health services, so health is near and dear to us here at TELUS. And if we talk about the build and the reach for fiber and what that means to the communities, from a health perspective, it can really transform what it means to have a doctor's appointment. 
And if we apply different TELUS IoT solutions as well, one of the things that we talk a lot about uh, at our, you know, within our teams is one of the focus areas is how do you help aging in the home and how do you help people stay in the home longer? Potentially it's having a solution that where there are sensors that are implemented throughout your house and it can monitor activity and it can identify different patterns. So if you have different sensors that are non-invasive, but there's a notification that goes to your caregiver, knowing, letting them know that maybe, you know, you haven't been getting out of bed before 2 p.m., whereas typically you used to get up at 7 a.m., maybe that's a sign of an un underlying condition, and having line of sight into that can give you the opportunity to provide treatment and to make sure that it doesn't lead to any critical uh, or more serious condition or also having an emergency detection solution. So it can be a body-worn solution, and if somebody does fall, there can be a notification that goes directly to emergency services and to caregivers. And that can result in faster action and to more po positive outcomes. So to, in conclusion, when we think of digital transformation and IoT, it's really three things that it's going to do. The first is you really want to create a better quality of life for your citizens and drive better outcomes. You want to be able to have the right information at the right time. How do you get insight where typically you didn't have that information to continue in improving your operational effectiveness? And you want to be able to scale and grow and being able to continue to drive customer loyalty and to be able to continue to drive, uh, grow business and drive more positive outcomes for everyone involved. So with that, I would like to thank you all for your time on behalf of Doug and I. Thank you, have a good day. Can everyone hear me? I think so, good. Well, this has been really interesting how the speakers are set up because um, you heard from New York City, where I was born, and now you're gonna hear about Haida Gwaii, where I've spent most of my working life. You've heard from TELUS and where they have fiber to the premise and where they're expanding themselves. But I'm, Haida Gwaii is one of those communities that wasn't a dot on that map. So what did we do? First, I'm gonna see that I can actually move the slide forward. Well, we'll see in a minute. Guaytel is a not-for-profit society that was established in 2006. It's owned by the municipalities, band councils, the regional district areas, and the Council of the Haida Nation. The board of directors and myself are volunteers. Our job is to bring the internet to Haida Gwaii where we supply the for-profit ISP. We're just gonna see if that was the button. Nope. There we go. So we're positioned off the northwest coast of British Columbia. We're 100 kilometers from the mainland, and we have an international airport, and we have UNESCO World Heritage Sites, and Parks Canada has a research center. We offer 15 credits uh, at UBC for courses for third year university students. We are 4,200 people spread across seven communities and outlying areas separated by two islands and from the mainland by the Hecate Straits. Travel is prohibitively expensive. BC Ferries connects the two islands and the islands to Prince Rupert. There are no planes east. All air is via hub service to Vancouver, so it's cheaper to fly to Hawaii. Cell service is available only in the major communities of Queen Charlotte, Skidigat, Sandspit, Masset, and Old Masset Village. The middle of the island is unserved. I had no cell phone service when I had a car accident just outside of Talel, but fortunately, a volunteer ambulance attendant heard the car go off the road. Canada Post discontinued all air mail service, though we have two planes leaving Haida Gwaii. All mail travels by ferry to Prince Rupert, winter schedule twice a week, and then by truck to Prince George. If it is special delivery, it then finds a plane. If not, it goes by truck to Vancouver. Categorized by remote by Canada Post, Companies like Walmart and Amazon charge us sled dog prices. 
Under these circumstances, the internet becomes an essential service, which we are happy to see that the new CRT's policy acknowledges. So what does the internet do for us? It takes the water out of the ocean and connects us to Canada and the world. It moves us from geographically and technically isolated to Skyping Africa and having our youth become creators of content rather than strictly receivers. Our students feel part of the world outside their home. They partner with other school districts. It allows flexibility in learning styles. It allows instant gratification. I did this rather than waiting for marks on a paper. It's a catalyst to lifelong learning. For teachers, Pro-D Day is now online training with live interactive workshops. Parent-teacher communicate with weekly reports, how was our week? And the parents are now more comfortable coming into the school. Travel around the islands and off-island meetings and workshops is reduced. These are tightly knit communities whose students do not always thrive in urban environments. Now we have the option of education via the internet. We can attract and keep our youth. UBC offers online courses and practicum-based masters. This helps stop the brain drain. We have challenges. Connectivity outside our major communities is poor to none. Back at home, the students struggled to keep up with assignments. Availability and affordability are the defining factors with the, the decline of high-paying resource jobs. Price decides usage. There's no free internet except the school and library and a couple of sh coffee shops, and those are in the major communities. The gap between strong access to little or none will continue to grow. BC mandated the use of the internet in education, but we do not have access equal to the mainland school districts. Even in our best served communities, residents can face speeds of seven and one. This is the new hospital at the south end of the islands. The internet addresses challenges of our health system where small populations cannot support specialist services, but travel is prohibitively expensive and there's a great need for family support. We are almost paperless now. Our records and even the printer is notified from Prince George. We can video conference with your oncologist, receive chemotherapy or consult a psychiatrist, and patients are pushing for more. As home care funding continues to drop, we need to find ways to enable, enable the elderly and homebound patient contact. This could lead to video via cell phone or laptop from the patient's home and one of our doctors is working on tech-enabled care, trying to launch a texting with patients program enabling interested patients to access the clinic nurses and physicians via text. We respect and encourage the arts. This weekend was the All Island Art Show and there were over 60 pieces, contributions from all the communities. The preservation of Haida language and culture are driving forces. The towns empty out to watch the all-native basketball tournament in Prince Rupert. These players are the heroes and the games are streamed to the cultural centers in Haida Gwaii and other coastal First Nation communities. Potlucks and feasts are all over Facebook. If you weren't there, you can still see the dancing. New artists and new modes of art, such as videographers, who can now work on island. And I think Patrick Shannon from Inno Native is here in the conference. He's one of ours. And of co course, our artists can sell via the net. The future is change. And the, we see the internet changing us from a resource-based community to a diverse economy. And we need to change. Our resources, fish and forestry, are affected by changing climate changing population numbers, and new agreements. We are a population of small, home-based businesses connected by the internet, but now our people can also work remotely. One consulted in Indonesia, Malaysia, and Africa. 
This is an example of a glass sponge, which are newly discovered reefs found through technology in the Hecate Strait. They are fragile. Guaitel is also fragile. Even with our not-for-profit structure, we can suffer unintended consequences. The TELUS hub came in and we lost 90 customers from the cell phone-enabled communities until the cell phone service that drives it was overwhelmed. Given a choice, the consumer chooses lower prices, of course. But Guaitel still needs to serve the outlying residents and now we have less income. We are grant-driven, and though we have been successful for major infrastructure, we still reach the mainland via radios, one of the longest links in North America. So we are ultimately limited by both quality and quantity. We need to continue to embrace connectivity. It informs us, challenges us, enables us, and connects us. It takes the water out of the ocean. Thank you, everyone. So I want to talk a little bit about how BC Hydro is moving towards becoming a digital utility, and I want to touch on uh, four items this afternoon. The first one is some of the, the key technology trends that we see are important for a utility such as ourselves. Um, where we see the value streams in becoming digital, what, where can we bring value both to our company and to our customers? And what I call eyes on the revolution, this changing landscape of our customer moving towards smarter and more autonomous systems. What does that mean to a conventional utility like us? And finally, some of the curves in the road. What, what lies ahead for us that we really need to be concerned about? So let me talk a little bit about the, the key tech trends. So on the left-hand side here, I'm partitioning these into two buckets. The first one is what I'm calling key transformative supplier load technologies. And these are things that really consume or produce a lot of electrons. Those are really of interest to electric utility like ours. So distributed generation is an obvious one. Uh, rooftop solar probably the most popular right now, often intermittent and still uh, a price point coming to the point where we can get a lot of those uh, hooked onto our system. Storage is also a key, whether it's grid scale or community scale or customer scale, uh, that's a very important technology also coming down in cost and when partnered with distributed generation can certainly help to reduce the intermittency of that kind of, that kind of uh, supply and then provide a very compelling case for self-sufficiency for communities and cities. And finally, our, the third one on there is electric transportation. As you may be aware, transportation in this province is still one of the areas where we can reduce the greenhouse gas emissions through electrification. And electric vehicles to BC Hydro look like loads. They're very interesting loads in that they're moving around the system, so we have to manage where they are and where they're charging. And when they come in numbers, that will be a, a concern for us and how we plan for them and how we actually operate them. And in the future, we expect to see them operating as vehicle to grid or vehicle to the home. So they'll look like a battery system and displacing generation that we would produce normally as a utility. And finally, what I'm calling industrial electrification, that's really fuel switching, moving away from fossil fuels like diesel and moving into a more electric age for some of the processes that are in industry. So those are important things for us in terms of supply and load. On the right-hand side is the transformative ICT technologies, the information and communication technology. Those are the things that this conference is largely about. So ubiquitous connectivity is kind of the, the, you know, the, 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 the king in this world. And for us, that's a big challenge. We have a service area that covers most of the province. That's almost a million square kilometers with a lot of rough terrain. We have workers working all over the province. So that's a really important uh, factor for us in terms of technology. Low-cost sensors and controls over the last couple of decades, the cost of getting information through a sensor has dropped dramatically. We can almost measure almost anything anywhere. And controls, once we know what we want to do, we can install a control almost anywhere and do anything with those controls. So that's really been an important breakthrough for us. Accessible and deep analysis. This kind of analytics typically was very tough to do, and now we see things like machine learning are very easy to come by. We can get those from, uh, from commercial entities very easily. They're very accessible. And cloud services are a very interesting thing for a utility, particularly a crown corporation like ours in a, in a province like British Columbia with very strict privacy laws. But it offers a, a number of very compelling uh, characteristics for uh, the digital utility. One is that, of course, if information's in the cloud, we can access, access that information from anywhere in the province, that huge service area that we have. And secondly, it provides an elastic and scalable high-performance computing environment that we can use for some of those deep analytics that we need to do uh, in the utility. And finally, the pervasive endpoint internet devices. I don't need to say anything about that. Everyone's got phones. We've got more than 1,000 surveillance cameras monitoring our substations. We've got people starting to look at wearable devices. All those things are coming at us in a huge wave. So those are kind of the, the table stakes, the kind of technologies that we see that are enabling us to become more digital. 
Let me talk about the, the value streams, where we think we're going to get value out of this digital utility. And this is a Reader's Digest version of what BC Hydro looks like. So we have big generation up in the north. Electricity is shipped down to the south where the load centers are through high voltage transmission. The voltages drop down to a lower level and then distribution feeders take that electricity and feed it out to our customers. A little truck that's there shows our workforce. We have a very large field force that maintains our assets and repairs it when storms happen. The little box on the left is our control center. We have two of those that do that tenuous balance of balancing matching generation to load minute by minute in the system to make sure it operates stably all the time for you. And of course, the top box on the left is our, our offices and field offices where the day-to-day -day business is run of running the company. So let me talk about kind of a number of the areas that we think we're going to get value, and we are getting value out of the digital, digitization of the utility. The first one is adding smart grid features to improve resiliency, safety, and efficiency of our utility. And the most profound change we've made in the last few years is the automation of our distribution system, those wires that come down your street towards your home. And what we've done with that is we're collecting information from, from field devices, including the 1.9 million smart meters we have installed, and using that information to quickly tell us where outages are occurring, and then using remote control switching to, to enable the, the changing of the distribution system to reduce the impact on our customers. Now in the future, that whole process is going to be completely automated, completely autonomous. Uh, we'll, we'll be able to measure those, detect the faults automatically, isolate the faults, optimize the system through algorithms that will determine the optimal routing and restore the maximum number of customers. That will be a self-healing network and that's really the earmark of a true smart grid. So that's just around the corner for us and for many utilities now. The second one is customer engagement and conservation. One, you know, one, one of the number one goals, the number one goal at BC Hydro is making it easy for the customer to do business with us. And so we engage the customer through multi-channels and they can do business with us through our website, for example, almost all the business they need to do with us. We're transporting that to a mobile platform. We provide them information on their energy usage through time, through the smart meter data that we have. We also provide some very uh, comprehensive outage information for them. So when there's a storm, we can go to your phone or to your website and see a map of where the outage is. You can get an indication of how long it's going to be before it's restored. And in the future, we're going to take more information, and things like weather data, and marry that up with the data that we have and provide further insights for the consumer. Things like, okay, my bill is very high this month. How come it's so much higher than it was a year ago? And that will be able to correlate with perhaps the weather that's occurring or other changes that may have happened. We have a very large field force, I mentioned that earlier, and we're mobilizing that field force by giving them mobile devices. They have phones, they have tablets, they have Wi-Fi in the more than 1,000 trucks we have. So they can do much of the work that they need to do in the office in the field. Um, that provides them also access to safety information. It allows them to do the work management better. And in the future, we see that that will become a fully-fledged office sort of in a box for them in the field. We'll also expect to see things like streaming video, uh, virtual reality, or augmented reality being used for doing maintenance on very sophisticated assets. So that's coming and will have a profound impact on the digitization. Distributed generation enablement is an important one. We're making inroads to, to assist in allowing the implementation of distributed generation like rooftop solar in the communities and in the cities. Um, there are kind of two pieces to that. One is the hardware side of it, putting that on the roof and making sure we can manage two-way power flow and all the paperwork that's associated with that. The other side is the digital side, monitoring those devices so we can understand for the, cons for the customer what the behavior of those systems look like, but more importantly for us to establish how we can schedule the rest of our generation when those kinds of generation becomes a large proportion of our, of our total portfolio. And data-driven asset management is a very, very important one. This can help us defer capital expenditures and reduce our operating costs. This really has come about because of the low-cost sensors and the connectivity that we can see in the system now. We can put sensors on virtually any device, generators, transformers, conductors, transmission towers, and gather that information up, perform analytics to determine the health of those assets, and design our, our uh, maintenance program based on the condition of the assets rather than on a timetable. So this is a really large benefit for us, and in the future, this will only grow as the connectivity and the number of sensors we have in the field increases. Office uh, automation and data-driven decisions, a good, this is a big benefit also from digitization. A good example of that is a revenue assurance program. So we're taking information from our 1.9 million smart meters and doing analytics on that to determine where theft is occurring, electricity theft is occurring in our province. And that has been a huge benefit to us over the last couple of years since that system went into play. And we can use that data for other things as well, like load forecasting, for example, and we can use it for designing conservation programs to help our customers reduce their energy usage in their homes. 
And the final one on here, which is most interesting to me because I'm a power engineer by training, is situational awareness and control. And you, you may not be aware, but BC Hydro is a very small portion of a very large interconnected system. That system covers the entire western seaboard of North America. That system is about 20 times the size of BC Hydro by installed generation capacity. So we are a little tail on a very big dog. And so it's very important for the guys sitting in that control center that circled there that operate and balance our system minute by minute to make sure they know what's going on around them so they can posture our system to be safe. And that means collecting not only local data, local in this context meaning provincial data, but also collecting data from that whole interconnected system all the way down to the border of Mexico, so all the U.S. utilities, collecting information from them, pushing that back up to the control center, doing some analytics, providing visualization for our operators so they can get our system into a stable situation in preparation for any disturbance that might happen in the, internal, in the external system that could impact us. So that's kind of really growing all the time as the communication channels get better and our visualization tools get better. The next thing I want to talk about is what I'm calling eyes on the revolution. This is sort of understanding the impact on our utility as the customer changes its characteristics, moving kind of smarter, becoming smarter and more autonomous. So at the bottom of this chart, if you look from the bottom up, it's kind of a hierarchy. You see devices, homes, complexes, communities, and cities. So all of those are sort of formats of customers to us. And if you look at the chain on the top from, from left to right, blue means connected. That means taking data and connecting those form factors for our customers, and meaning they can, we can exchange and share data with them. If we add analytics to that and some automatic controls, then those entities can become smart. And they're making decisions internally without any human intervention, and probably without BC Hydro knowing about it. So manage buildings, manage homes, those types of, of technologies. And on the right, if those systems can become actually self-powered, meaning they have a nice combination of distributed generation and storage in an energy management system wrapping it, so they can, be, they can actually move off the grid and operate autonomously on their own, then they become something quite different. They become unique and separate from our grid. And that's what engineers would call a microgrid. It self, self can be independent, operate either on or off the grid in a sustained manner. So from BC Hydro's perspective, we have to wonder what happens when customers move from left to right on this, on this kind of transition. One thing that it means is how do we engage with the customer? Obviously, on the right-hand side, they're independent. On the left-hand side, we're exchanging data all the time. So what does that storyline mean in terms of communicating and engaging with our customers? The second thing is, what does it mean for BC Hydro in terms of our generation requirements and indeed our revenue? Uh, as we move to the right, uh, energy consumption that's coming from us is, coming, is going down. It, the systems are becoming, the smart homes or communities are becoming more and more independent. And finally is really, what is the role of BC Hydro as a utility that has big wires that carry electricity as we move from left to right in here? Do we become backup power for, for distributed microgrids that are off in the system? Do we become the highway for transactive energy where distributed generators are exchanging power between each other and maybe using a ledger like blockchain to do those transactions? Or indeed, are we going to sit somewhere in the blue and the green area in the future? Are we not going to do much of the red? You know, we, that, so for BC Hydro, we're trying to understand now what the future is going to look like, how far are we going to go on to the right, how many of our customers will actually become this kind of smart, autonomous, independent bodies. So that's kind of a, a story on, on understanding the characteristics of our customer. And the last thing I want to talk about is the curves in the road. I've touched on some of these. These are the things that, that are kind of we want to be watchful for as we move into this connected, smart, and autonomous world. First one I mentioned, the new business models. What does a conventional utility have to morph itself into to manage in this new world where uh, buildings and communities are kind of doing their own thing internally? Second is reliability and security. And security here, I, I mean the kind of security that we're able to survive a disturbance in the system. So traditionally, we have a very good method of doing that now. We have a big interconnected system with lots of inertia. The controls are all really managed by BC Hydro. What happens when we start seeing controls that are internal to a building or a community? How do we coordinate those when we have a disturbance in the system? Can we maintain system stability through, throughout a disturbance? Third one is workforce, probably a top of mind for everyone. What kind of skills are going to be needed in this new world, uh, particularly in the utility space, and where are we going to get them from, and how are we going to keep them, and how are we going to pay, afford them? Um, fourth one is bandwidth. I think that's a question on everybody's mind. When we talk about things like using virtual reality in the field and streaming video and you know, equipping 5,000 workers with wearable devices, how are we going to keep up with the appetite that we have for this amazing growth in bandwidth requirement? And if I put my engineer's cap on, the, the second last bullet's probably the most important for me, standards, architecture, and interoperability. Making sure that things that we connect in this new world meet appropriate standards, they have prudent architecture, and they have interoperability so we can sustain these systems over time. 
And if I take my engineer's hat off and put my CIO's hat on, then cybersecurity and privacy are probably the number one consideration. Um, as the dimension of connectivity grows, the complexity grows, so does the exposure to cyber risks. And if those of you in the room who are familiar with the event that happened in the Ukraine in 2015, where effectively an IT system was hacked to get credentials, and ultimately a power system was operating side of it was hacked and customers were disconnected, that kind of really highlights the need for having an end-to-end -end view of this connected schemes that we're putting together um, to make sure that we can protect them from, from uh, cyber attacks and maintain the privacy of the information that's at hand. So that kind of, sorry. So that kind of ends my uh, talk on how I see BC Hydro moving into an inter, as an interconnect, as a digital utility, and some of the challenges that we're going to have into the future. So thank you very much. Ten to forty thousand years ago, our ancestors started to paint on the walls of caves across Europe. They left, as we know, beautiful paintings of animals. But those early hominids also left something else. They started to record symbols. In black and in red paint, they left dots and dashes and chevrons, thousands of these symbols. There is a paleoanthropologist named jean viev von Petzinger, who is a researcher at the University of Victoria. And she has documented these geometric shapes. And what she is saying is that this may be the first time that, as people, we stored information outside ourselves. Our early ancestors left information there for someone else to decode and understand. Now, if we think about what we as people need, the Maslow's hierarchy of needs says that we need shelter, food and water, we need safety, and we need a sense of belonging. So my theory is that what was left and recorded was information, the earliest information, that other people could then learn about things like safety. So I will leave the actual interpretation up to experts like Jean Viev, but today I'm gonna to talk about something I do know about. I'm gonna talk about risk and how we control it. I'd like to talk about machine learning and ethics in algorithms, and I'd like to talk about data sharing and data sourcing. In 2014, the executive office of the President of the United States had a paper that said, treating government data as an asset and making it available, discoverable, and usable, or in a word, open, strengthens democracy, drives economic opportunity, and improves citizens' quality of life. And it goes on to say, to consider openness and machine readability as the new defaults while appropriately safeguarding security, confidentiality, and privacy. Now, in 2015, the BC Safety Authority's Board of Directors passed a motion that data was a material asset of our organization, and so as such, was material to our mandate for public safety. At BCSA, openness means openly sharing in the form of data content education, published information, and pure data files. So what do we do? Well, our task is to build confidence and safety systems for life, and we do that across British Columbia. We oversee the safe installation, operation, and maintenance of complex technical equipment. So, what, uh, what is that complex technical equipment? This is electrical wiring and controls in your home. And this is the kind of thing where we say, electricity needs to stay where we're gonna put it. It means gas, energy delivery, liquefied gas, hydrogen gas, and natural gas. It means being able to wire a hot tub 
so that actually it stays in a place of integrity. It means boilers that produce steam energy for heat, for hospitals, and for pulp mills. It means every home and RV in the province of British Columbia is plumbed properly for gas, for electricity, and potentially for boilers. It means elevators that all 4.7 million people in the province of BC can use for people and for cars, and escalators that go up at an angle and those that turn as they go up. It also means ski lifts, amusement rides, and rail. And when we go up, we want to stay up. We directly impact two-thirds of the province's overall GDP through the amount of work and equipment that we touch, through equipment permits, licenses, and by granting technical qualifications to workers. We also work in complex sites with failures such as dust explosions. We have 370 employees. So how do we oversee and promote technical safety leadership? Well, we use risk analytic tools. And this is an example. This is a standard bow tie diagram for, for risk analysis. And basically, it suggests that you need to put multiple gates in front of an incident in order to prevent it. You can also stop that incident from propagating even worse damage. Where we want to be is on the prevention side. We are creating and using database tools that give us the ability to assess where risks occur and what drives risk. And the way we do that is through a smart algorithm. We have an algorithm called the Risk Allocation Program. And this drives our understanding of what is going on from a risk perspective across the province. It allows us to prioritize the places that we go and the places that we will physically assess equipment. But it also ensures that we can regulate and review all technical equipment in the province of BC. So this is James. And James is using the risk allocation program on an app on his iPad. He's using it for electrical, but we have the same opportunity in every technology that we oversee. 10 years ago, we had a minimum viable product around this tool. It was simply a decision support tool. And we were trying to codify what people like James and his colleague would make as their decisions for when they were looking at equipment. What RAP allows us to do is to develop a tool that actually learns. It allows us to understand all the individual factors that contribute to the risks associated with a piece of equipment. That is the design and age of the equipment, where it's installed, who installed it, the kind of building it's in, and the, who is maintaining it. Now, just to describe how this works, 225,000 times a year, a technical worker or someone who owns complex technical equipment will provide a data file to us asking for permission and approval to either install a piece of equipment or to continue to operate and maintain it. All 225,000 of those files are processed through our smart algorithm. They are then risk allocated in terms of what we understand to be the highest risks that we should go to. And they end up on James and his colleagues' iPad. They are risk prioritized pieces of work which we then can put our smart resources towards. So this is a data visualization of our smart algorithm. This is the visualization of the many different inputs that go into a smart resource allocation program. And what you see in the top three points are specifically in electrical, what are the three different kinds of places that you would install electrical equipment? At the very top is whether it is a residence, whether it is a commercial, or whether it is an industrial installation. If you drop down a line in this visualization, you then get to occupancy type. 
Occupancy is very important to us because it makes a difference from a risk perspective, whether it's a school or a hospital with vulnerable populations, or whether it's a greenhouse. As you continue down the visualization, you see multiple factors associated with, in the case of electrical, what is the inherent hazard that exists? Is it high voltage? Clearly, that's a higher hazard. Another line in the data visualization shows you there are multiple factors associated with the actual installer of the equipment. Do we have a history of this person? Do they have non-compliances? So this visualization shows the many different factors that we are developing in RAP. But if we go back to James, we are using this algorithm as a closed system. So while we take into account 225,000 data files a year, we are sampling at a 50,000 file rate. Those samples, which would have James and his colleague, so the safety officer, she goes out to a site, and she is going to look at the risks associated with the equipment, and she is going to rank those risks, the hazards that she sees on a five-point scale. That information is going to go back in the algorithm to help it learn. It does two things. It tunes our algorithm and makes it smarter. And independent of the algorithm, it allows us to find trends as new risks and hazards emerge. We are able to find out what is happening in real time. So what we have learned is that we find safety issues twice as often in existing electrical installations as we do in new installations. And we also know that those individuals who have not obtained permits or licenses are two to four times more likely to leave hazards at a site. This is a generalized linear model using the software R. We are testing our algorithms for statistical significance across the number of factors. And R is particularly useful for small data, which 225,000 is. But we are continuously experimenting on making our risk algorithm more predictive. We currently run RAP on a relational database, Oracle. But we are experimenting with Random Forest, which is hosted on DataIQ, which is an open source machine learning software. And why would we need parallel processing in the future? we are simply going to be exposed to much more data. There's higher velocity in our data. It is coming at us faster, and it is coming in a much more complex form and through multiple channels. And we're doing continuous learning, too, using open source tools, Spark, Hadoop, and H2O, which are all database management frameworks that can handle big data. We want to be on the forefront of learning. So, machine learning. We can take the same principles that we put to work through our RAP algorithm, balancing risks and priorities, and apply them to safety operations in new ways. We are exploring ways to use image analytics software to help understand and classify potential risks. If you look at this very large propane storage tank, of which there are 55,000 in British Columbia, particularly in rural areas. How many hazards do you see? Do you see two? Vote four. Do you see six? Image analytics, we are training it to understand that to see vegetation underneath a propane tank is a hazard. The propane tank should be on a concrete slab so it doesn't float away in a floodplain and it remains stable. There shouldn't be this kludgy lever system preventing the tank from rolling down into a ditch. The tank shows signs of rust. It may have a material integrity problem. The weather cap does not sit on top of the release valves. The tank is far too close to a dwelling. These are all things that image analytics can be trained to predict and understand. We do this because we are more than a safety organization. We are a data and knowledge organization. We are about collecting and sharing data that supports clients, contractors, and asset owners. 
with the information they need to make good safety decisions and prevent hazards. I'd like to talk a bit about ethics. The way that we prioritize these hazards has an ethical element. For example, we rank public gathering spaces like schools and hospitals as higher priority. These are vulnerable populations. These are social decisions that we are baking into the use of our algorithms. We have a responsibility to be transparent about our decision science, which may have social and policy considerations. And transparency keeps us accountable to the decisions that we're making. We're also encouraging citizen data scientists. We invite you to come and scrape our data. Our state of safety data is located on our website. It exists right now in a flat file, but I am sure that we will be moving to an API or a plugin in order to provide you real-time streaming state of safety data. We have data shared with the University of British Columbia to a community of researchers. Looking at this map, right now from a data sharing perspective, if someone is operating outside the system, we don't always know where they are or what they're doing. But we are working with information partners to change this. By tapping into different sources of data, we can bring more people into the safety system. So for instance, our energy partners, when they are asked to energize a new home or business under construction, so send it gas or hook up the electricity, this gets checked against permits and licenses that we issue to identify areas where unpermitted work might occur. And unpermitted work is four to six times more likely to produce hazardous conditions. We can bring open source data into this too, using search results and online directories and building permits. When we combine image analytics, machine learning, predictive algorithms, and open source data, we end up with entirely new methods to better manage safety performance and improve safety outcomes. Well, finally, safety comes down to people. We set ethical choices up in the rules that using our algorithms have to protect the public, but the public, too, has an active role in the safety system. And I show you this slide because you may use one of these escalators at the convention center today or tomorrow. But you are part of the safety equation, and you also have choice. So please, hold the handrail on your way out. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for the nice introduction. I'm Stefan Karish, and I'm responsible for analytics in Boeing Commercial Aviation Services. And I'm going to have a slightly different angle uh, to this track. So we heard a lot about smart connected cities, and I will talk a little bit about how we smartly connect cities, because aviation has now for more than 100 years uh, connected the world. We have made the world smaller, and when you look at an airplane, uh, here it is. Uh, like the, the Boeing 787 Dreamliner, we can now connect with a uh, twin-engine airplane every, pretty much every city pair in the world with a direct flight. So the world has become smaller. And thanks to data analytics, to, to data science and big data, aviation has never been as safe, efficient, reliable, and economical as it ever has been today. And uh, when you, just from an economic point of view, it has never been as inexpensive to fly uh, by uh, use air transportation. And aviation was really a pioneer from the get-go in information technology and leveraging data. I think aviation created the first reservation systems, revenue management comes from that area, loyalty programs that are now being used widely. And when you talk about the Internet of Things, of things, what we see back there is actually one data-rich node of the Internet of Things. Uh, the 787 Dreamliner creates about 28 megabyte of data on every single flight that we can take off the airplane that makes it a smart airplane and that we can leverage to help airlines operate more efficiently. And Boeing is not only 
building airplanes. We're also, um, and that's what commercial aviation services does. We're also supporting our customers after they bought the airplanes and help them run their business more, businesses more reliably and operate them more efficiently. So just to level set, when we talk about analytics, um, analytics is really, there's, there's, it's a scientific process that takes data and, and creates insights that allow us to drive better decisions. But what it's really for us is a transformational process that creates new awareness, that, that takes data and, and lets us then ask new questions. And when we look at what happened over the last 10 or 15 years, yes, we have developed reservation systems and, and revenue management systems and other decision support systems for a very long time. But during the last 10 or 15 years, there's really been a convergence of technologies. We can process, cr create large amounts of data, we can process them efficiently, and then we can, we can actually uh, build decision support around that, 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 that drive better outcomes. And you see the tools and methods that are also evolving. And the opportunity we have now is that we can now answer questions that we even didn't even dare to, to ask 10 or 15 years ago. And, and with more and more data coming into the picture and the aviation system becoming more and more connected, uh, there are very exciting times ahead. So when we look at the aviation system, it's a highly complex system. Um, in 2015, there were about 22,500 jet airplanes being operated by airlines around the world. We expect that number to double uh, in the next 20 years. There will be about 45,000 airplanes in service. Today, airlines operate 102,000 flights every single day. And in 2016, uh, they spent $700 billion to run their business, to run their operations. When we look at the major carrier, and it's a major North American carrier, they operate hundreds of airplanes, operate thousands of flights every day, uh, have tens of thousands of crew members, pilots and flight attendants that need to be scheduled to operate these, these airplanes or uh, get on them and there are millions of passengers to be, to be served. And this is highly, highly complex, and you couldn't do that by, without leveraging the data, without applying analytics to drive better decisions. And in the middle of that graph, you can actually see the expected growth. I mentioned already that we see the number of airplanes uh, being operated to double within the next 20 years. Uh, we also see passenger volumes increase significantly. And this is all happening while the capacity, airspace capacity, airport capacity is growing at a much lower, slower pace. So how do we overcome that? How, how can we help airlines overcome that? So by using data and, and data science and analytics uh, to drive their performance. And airlines, even if the, when the system becomes more and more uh, constrained, they're operating at, at record levels. In 10, 10 years ago, in 2007, uh, more than a fourth, more than 25% of flights were delayed, and, in, and we mean this is by 50 minutes or more. Uh, now, in 2017 or 2016, 10 years later, uh, in North America, on-time performance was at a record high at 81.4%. That's a significant improvement considering that everything gets tighter. Uh, there have only been 1.17% of flights canceled. That's less than a third to what it was 10 years ago. And we can do that by applying analytics. And, um, and the, when we look at then at the third portion here, the growth of data, I mentioned already that the 787 generates a lot of data. When we just look at airplane data growth, it, it grows from, uh, I think already what we call big data to uh, a petabyte by 2033. So, and this is where we can now start leveraging uh, this data even more and, 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 and think about new ways to, to make the aviation system more efficient. And our vision at Boeing is to create a future with no surprises. So that means we have analytics-enabled smart airplanes. That also means that uh, we empower airlines with analytics. 
so that they can proactively manage their operations rather than reacting to disruptions. And then uh, we also see that obviously people are getting supported with analytics. And let me just walk through what that would mean for a single flight, what's happening in the background of a single flight. So maybe you, this is where you go at, on your next trip. You're sitting on that plane. Uh, here's what happened beforehand or what's going to happen for that, that flight to push back on time. So first of all, your flight is one of 102,000 or more than 102,000 flights operated across the world. So somebody needed to have to schedule that, needed to make sure there's gate available, landing slots, uh, takeoff slots, and everything. So that's, that was analytics. Then you need crew members. And crew planning often starts 18 months before the crew actually gets to the gate. When you do hire pilots, because you need to train them, and they, they, they need to move up the ranks. And then a month before your flight, somebody did some, some very complex, uh, applied, uh, complex mathematical algorithms to build crew schedules that cover all the flying, so that made sure that you had a crew member on board or uh, two pilots in the cockpit and uh, a number of flight attendants in the back. And that also made sure that all these schedules meet duty time limitations, flight time limitations, and that they even took crew preferences into account. Again, a lot of analytics that, that uh, got you to that stage. Then the pilot in the cockpit gets a lot of real-time intelligent information through mobile devices now. They, they always know the latest weather updates, navigation information. They're in constant contact with the ground, with somebody in the operation center, the dispatcher that creates the flight plan on how to what the optimal route is to get from your current city to the next city, how to take weather into account. We have big data problems around, or data opportunities around weather. Um, or if maybe one of the crew members had called in sick, uh, it's the operation center that find, found a replacement crew out of a reserve, or maybe they pulled them off another flight. And then when, the, when your flight lands at the next destination, since the airplane, uh, captures all that flight sensor data. It also transmits it already during flight back to the ground so that when, the, when it comes to the gate that the maintenance technician has already some first indications of maybe what needs to be done with that airplane. Or otherwise we load down the, the rest of the data and continuously monitor it so that when we need to change a part, uh, we, we change it at the next scheduled maintenance so that we avoid that uh, you're sitting at the gate and you see a maintenance technician get on board, and then the pilot talks about a lot about the paperwork they need to go through. So we want to avoid that. That's what we see as a future of no surprises. And then we also need to look at how do we drive the logistics behind that. So how do we make sure, as a space provider, what Boeing also is, how do we make sure that we have the right part at the right location at the right time uh, for our customers around the world, that when they have uh, uh, a, a, an airplane that, that needs a part that that flight can, can still take off or that the delay is minimized. So that's our vision, and that vision is already reality, at least at that stage. So when you take your next flight, you know that there are services behind it. There is data science and analytics supplied that made the right decisions for your flight to, to, to get there on time. So. Uh, as last part of my presentation, I have a short video. So I came from Seattle to give this presentation, but we have actually an office here. It's Boeing Vancouver. We have two offices, one in Richmond and one just around the corner in Yale Town. And those folks built some of these, so my colleagues here built some of these solutions I talked about, and they are actually creating that future of what we see by leveraging the ever-growing data uh, amounts we have. And I'd like to introduce the office with a short video. I think we're building an, an incubator environment here, trying to solve new problems in new ways and failing and learning and trying again and doing all of that uh, in really 
close connection with our stakeholders and our users to make sure that we're learning from them about what their needs are. Labs is about building products for our customers. Most, if not all, of those products have some sort of analytics core. And for us to prove that you know data is useful, we really want to tie it to the business. Analytics, I like to say, is either going to help you do what you do today faster, or it's going to do what you're not able to do today. It's almost like you've given them some superpower that they didn't have. When we compare ourselves to what else is happening in Vancouver, especially around data science and development, I think analytics is the differentiator for us. I think in some ways, Boeing Vancouver is almost the best of both worlds. So combining product development capabilities and the analytics capabilities that we have in labs to really create something that is 10 times the impact of it was just product development or just the analytics services. That's where the secret sauce is. So it's a quite a different operating rhythm from other product development teams in industrial aviation and Boeing. Fuel, for example. Fuel, we know it's very expensive and the more we can save fuel, the better for the airlines. To do that though, we need to be able to crunch through thousands of flights and tens of thousands of sensor data. So it's one thing to just have a whole bunch of data, but it's another thing to know what to do with it and to be able to sort of string that all together into um, a story that can be told to you know, your next door neighbor and have, have them understand. That crunching of the numbers and then being able to make sense and find out what the best practices are in order to identify for a pilot or a dispatcher to change their behavior, those are the key things that analytics can help do to drive evidence-based decisions decisions and behavior changes. So we've got a couple of interesting projects going on right now, trying to basically use data which is coming off the aircraft to predict when the aircraft is going to break. The idea with that is if you can determine when the aircraft is going to break ahead of time, then you are able to proactively uh, do maintenance to that aircraft, preventing it from being uh, down unexpectedly and also saving money in the process. Analytics can help and come up with a better end-to-end -end optimization solution. You're able to give people the ability to do things they just really couldn't do before. Some people try and design culture. I think ours was partly designed, partly grown, and everyone here just sort of fits together into an amazing working team. I like to think of it as a playground for new ideas. I'm actually looking forward to coming to work every day. I'm learning as I work. An open area concept helps us to talk to each other, so we're always available, we're always able to find each other and collaborate on any topics or discussions. At the end of the day, we're trying to help the airlines run cheaper, faster, and more efficiently. And we all play a part in that. So we have an incredibly talented and passionate team here, and we are very happy to, to be here in Vancouver. And we actually have a booth just around the corner on the back. So if you want to know more about the secret sauce, more of how we do that, how we smartly connect cities, please connect with any of my colleagues here. And I appreciate your time and for the opportunity to share this with you. Thank you. To finish things off, I'll welcome some of our speakers from this afternoon back to uh, have a panel discussion on how we get all of our jurisdictions talking and maybe the opportunities both for um, business and for citizens and for startups within that ecosystem. So first, help me welcome back to the stage Minerva Tantoko, Catherine Room from BC Safety Authority, Doug Sage from TELUS. Kip Morrison from VC Hydro, <laughs> and Hayden Lansdell. Uh, we haven't heard from Hayden today, but Hayden is from the Center for Data Innovation with the BC government. Thank you, and welcome to all of you. Great to be back. All right. So my first question is actually a simple one, just to set the stage a bit. And it's, it's this theme that we're talking about, connecting the dots, and how do we get our jurisdictions talking? Do we even want them talking? Is there any opportunity there? So maybe quickly, we could go uh, one by one. And, and you could tell me, from your viewpoint, what are the dots? in your particular, from your particular perspective? Um, and, and do we need to connect them? And should we connect them? And maybe what the risk of not doing so is. So uh, just maybe straight down the line on that question. Sure, absolutely. I think there's so much value to be gained by sharing information, best practices, use cases across the different jurisdictions. I think we, we the whole planet benefits from having more smart cities there. 
um, with 70% of the world's population moving into urban areas by the year 2050. It's going to be all about the cities and how we all manage um, the planet together. Excellent. So Catherine, same question to you. What are the dots in, from your perspective? I think that in general, the public just believes that entities that are either authorities or crowns or government, any agency, is already sharing data. I think that's just a given. And I think the public would be surprised to know it's quite difficult to actually connect databases. But that's an expectation, is that the right things are happening on behalf of the public. Yeah, agreed with that, for sure. It's interesting, I think maybe we'll get into the data and privacy aspect later, but as those lines blur for citizens, especially the usage of mobile phones and that, um, the convergence of that data will bring up some interesting use cases. So Doug, our, our um, private sector panelists, so how about you tell us from your viewpoint, what are the dots? The dots are the exist, in our perspective, the dots are the existing uh, uh, functional structures, data repositories, and, um, and uh, pre-existing processes that need to be connected to, uh, to leverage the power of, uh, of the, 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 the data repositories behind them. So uh, once they start talking, um, you can take things like uh, home health sensors and an, an aging patient at home connect them with practitioners, with loved ones, with extended support network, and that produces better health outcomes. Those are the dots, and, and uh, it's a classic uh, uh, one plus one equals three scenario. Yep. Kip, over to you. Well, I think for us, there's a, there's a huge benefit in, in moving towards the smart city and smart community, mainly in energy efficiency for us, since that's our game that we're in. Uh, working together, collaboration is probably the dots here as to uh, individual goals and what the role each of the parties are going to play going forward. I think we can talk about later about some of the challenges around that sharing, particularly around the privacy issues in British Columbia, which for BC Hydro, because of the nature of the customer data that we're holding, uh, poses some very big roadblocks for us that we need to get, get through. But I think that collaboration factor and understanding what our roles and responsibilities are is going to be important. And Hayden, last but not least. Yeah, I guess the only thing I'd add to what everybody else has said, and I'd maybe picking up on Catherine's point a little, is that the public expects that we are sharing this information in many ways. In my mind, the public is, a re is that pivot point around which we need to focus the discussion. Uh, I know that many people I know don't know the difference necessarily between the federal or the provincial or the local government. What they want is government services. and. With data, you know, the provincial government may have 60% of the data on that citizen, the municipality 20. Um, the more we can work together to have a complete picture of that citizen's interaction with government, the better. So there's really a direct correlation between the availability of data, the leveraging of that data, and then sort of the satisfaction piece at the tail end, whether it's a customer satisfaction piece or a citizen satisfaction piece. Um, that data requires a lot of bandwidth, and Kip, you, you touched on this a little bit. So my next question was all around bandwidth, capacity, and infrastructure. We tend to spend a lot of time as a society talking about our water infrastructure, our electric infrastructure, our roads, our bridges, our, our borders, our ports. Um, but the conversation around bandwidth is just starting. And, and, and I often see this in business where we'll get permits to the city where we have digital creative companies that need to send large animation files to production houses in Hollywood and back and forth. And so they need to create dedicated superhighways to manage those files. And I imagine, Catherine, is the numbers that you're crunching. And if you have iPads out in the field, you need to have quite big pipes to receive that data and send information back. And Thank Kip, I can only imagine. <laughs> so I'll start with Doug on this one. W w what do you see as the sort of the future of, of these information superhighways and, and then maybe turn it around to everybody in terms of is this going to be a rate limiter and what are you doing about it? As I started to say in my presentation, I think this is the first time where uh, we can see supply leading demand when it comes to bandwidth and the, the pure fiber build from TELUS in particular. Um, in fact, uh, right here in Vancouver, we have some of the first uh, wireless 5G trials going on in the world, um, just in the downtown core. Uh, we, you need fiber as a, as a backhaul for 
uh, for wireless technology, uh, and and we'll be at the fore of that. I I think that um, even with with current uh, gigabit technology, you know, we're delivering symmetric 250 to uh, a couple of towns in BC, 150 in others, upgradable to in a couple of years we'll see 20 gig, and uh, and this is just the beginning. So, I, but 20 gig wireless. Or 20 gig. That wired. was wired. Sorry, to, yeah. to be clear. Um, will it be enough? I, I, I can't say. Someone once said 64k is enough RAM, right? Yeah. <laughs> so Kip, I mean, you you manage a vast network of things. Um, how and you touched on it a little bit, but what are the future needs for BC Hydro, and maybe even the homes that you see connected in terms of bandwidth and capacity? And are we doing enough? Yeah, I think it's pretty hard to predict where that's going. I think we rely on uh, on folks like Telus to make sure that we have adequate bandwidth. Part of, part of the issue is not just having bandwidth sort of locally or in the major areas, but having it in the remote areas that service. You know, we have a very large service area for, as I mentioned, where for our customers, very difficult for us to even get uh, smart meters to those wireless smart meters to those customers. So uh, the notion of sort of having big data exchange or fully connected networks to them. Is, is the future, but we have to have that infrastructure. And the, the second thing is also the reliability of that, those networks. We become entirely dependent on them. The analogy to a power system is, is not lost. I mean, we have to be able to deal with the situation where we lose one of those channels and need to rely on something else, given that our entire process is dependent on that connectivity now. And so, you know, the work that we're doing with TELUS around our data center is like that, that we're making sure that we have adequate bandwidth, not just for day-to-day -day operations, but under emergency conditions. And that's something that you know, we'll have to think forwardly about if we're going to depend on these kinds of things as our mainstay, not just as, you know, the new cool thing. This will become business for us. Yeah. So, Hayden, I guess from the provincial side, um, do, you, do you see uh, an, a move towards changing the disparity between access in cities and rural communities? And, and what is the province doing about that? I know that the province is very committed to increasing connectivity across all of the, or the provincial government is committed to increasing connectivity across the entire province. I know they're working with TELUS, they're working with numerous companies. For us, it's about being able to connect in you know, rural health, connect in rural economic development, and being able to allow communities throughout the province to be able to participate in, in some of the opportunities that, that uh, the province is putting out. Actually, that, that also raises an interesting concept, which is that not only are, are our homes getting connected, but the way we get traditional services like healthcare are changing. So now you know you can go and you can get your results from your blood tests right away on a portal versus actually having to wait for the doctor to call you. Um, I think that's going to really transform. So that segues a little bit into our data sharing. So Hayden, you had mentioned that citizens have an expectation that we share data. I would also argue that citizens have an expectation that we not share data. And I think um, some agencies might share it anonymously. Others don't necessarily have data sharing agreements. But maybe, Catherine, I'll ask you, uh, given we're talking about safety, do you think that it is incumbent upon agencies like us who have information around the contextual environment to share data with each other if it helps solve crime or it helps prevent any kind of tragedy? I think that... Part of our responsibility is, one, to have engagement with the public, with our stakeholders, to put that question to them. I, I think deep, I feel deeply that actually citizens want a certain level of sharing for base level safety and security. I think that's just a given and there's an expectation that that exists. I think for other things where it's extremely personal, like health data, you can understand why even at a personal level that's something you want a lot of confidentiality around. But that's, those are two very different things and there seems to be a line around that. People don't mind having uh, someone who's in charge of uh, policing on their uh, corner, but they also don't want someone peering in their window. We think, I think we need to ask our stakeholders, where is the line? We can make up what we believe it to be, but I think we have a responsibility to ask them. And once they clarify, then I think we need to get on with it and start providing that base level of safety and security based on an information share. Minerva, where do you think that line is? Like, where do you think the line is between data sharing that's acceptable and not acceptable? Yeah, it's certainly very, very um, 
much an evolving situation. For example, you know, one of the open data sets is our uh, emergency data calls. And you, know, you certainly want to know what areas have the highest number of in our, in 911 in, in New York um, and you know, locations uh, where that is. But you don't want enough information so that someone could figure out who actually called in the noise complaint about your party, right? Um, <clears throat> so you know, I think it's very much a case-by-case -case basis, data that you would think, OK, let's look at noise complaint by neighborhood. You know, but you also don't want to get people in trouble with their neighbors um, when they called about your, your party. So you have to be able to not only think about the purpose of the data, but also how you want to strip out and which pieces of information you want to strip out to assure you know, everyone's safety and, and privacy. The interesting thing that, that is that even just doing that is often not enough because you can always re- mm -hmm. Uh, combine the information that's out there and figure out the address and the time and and so you know it's a constant balancing act. Um, with that's often not the explicit that. story in the data. It's the inferences we can make that's from the right. data. And I suppose Kip, in in your case, there, you can infer a lot through energy data. Energy data is valuable to to people who are trying to meet sustainability goals, uh, trying to meet policy targets around. You know, like we've got a, a you know housing crisis, and I, I I've seen you know energy data seen as an ability to drive decisions, or or even in the case of um, just wanting to understand how consumers' energy patterns are. So I, I imagine there's a lot of demand for anonymous energy data from. BC yeah, Hydro. That, that's exactly right. And with with the advent of deep analytics and big data assessment, that's growing and growing. I think it's to be determined how that's all going to play out and what, what benefit the customer is going to see from doing that and what, to what extent they release data. I think the other, the other challenge in this discussion is when I share data with you, you have an expectation that you're the only one that's seeing that data, but that data resides somewhere as well. And that's for us, that's also a big challenge that, you know, I mentioned privacy before, but that data can't sit in a private cloud for us because of data sovereignty rules. It probably can't even sit in Canada if it gets routed through the US to get to you. Um, so, so just the fact that you want to share that data with me is not the simple question. The simple question extends beyond the fact that we share it, but how, how do we actually go about sharing it? And the energy data we have, which may at have attached personal data around who the consumers are, is considered private data and we protect that. So I think it's a very complex question in terms of you know, who you share it with and also how you're going to share it. Do you think the appetite for data, data will compound? So now our data and analytics and data crunching capability can't handle the big data we're sitting on. But eventually, with more and more examples like Boeing Labs, where we actually have dedicated centers intended to crunch large amounts of data, our capacity will grow. And do you think that eventually our ability to crunch the data will meet the data availability? I don't know, maybe Hayden, you tell me what you think sitting um, yeah, probably not. I, I think that what's happening is we're just creating more and more data. So the more we create the capability to analyze and make decisions from that data, the more we start to bring in more and more data sets and more and more flows into the environments in which we are doing this analysis. So, you know, I'm no expert on Moore's Law or anything like that, but I, I just feel like it's a constant evolution. So. Uh, let's go to more connected things and more data generation. So now it's 2020, and we're told that there's anywhere, depending on who you listen to, between 18 billion and 250 billion connected things, right? So it's a wide range of connected things. Um, so the internet landscape is going to change a lot as a result of that. So Minerva, do you have any predictions about the kind of infrastructure changes that might be ahead of us that are beyond just internet connectivity and the data analytics tools we have now? Do you have any thoughts on what the future might hold? Sure, I think you know uh, there will be a ripple effect all the way up the stack from you know the base level types of uh, connectivity, everything from mesh networks to you know big pipes, and at some point a kind of network of networks because I see a lot of potential noise in the in that space, and then you know levels up from there. I think there's a huge opportunity in developing precisely the kind of analytics platforms that don't yet exist that will be created in the next five years or so. Um, 
to not only manage the crunching of the data, but actually to help develop you know, the insights um, that will create the decision-making uh, policies based on the data. So it's really sort of what is the end game here? Are we looking at, you know, you know, if we use health data, does that, and, and we can correlate that with pollution data, and then that will help drive some, some policy decisions specific to those geographical areas, for example. And so I think, you know, right now we're in such an early phase where you know, some basic technologies being done and individuals, I would call it like vertical applications of this. So the horizontal platforms will be evolving over the next few years to accommodate all the uses that we'll, we will discover. So it's interesting because hearing to everybody talk, there's an inherent almost marriage that happens between the network and the data. And so as more things are deployed, are we gonna see more of a connection between limiting the size of a network mm -hmm. to be able to limit the scope of data being generated? Mm -hmm. So in your case, for example, this isn't one of the questions I emailed you guys ahead of time, but I'm being inspired by the conversation in that I'm thinking about your inspectors out in the field. I'm thinking about the smart meters and I'm thinking about the health services there's likely to be more and more of this marriage between here is the network and the connectivity between the devices, and then here is the data solution. So Catherine, what do, you, what do you think about that? I think the opportunity is really all benefit. I know there's concerns about harm, but I actually think the upside is so much more powerful, which is obviously why we're having this conference. One of the things that we're doing is engaging a robo-ethicist. So there's a PhD candidate at UBC named Ah Jung Moon, who is beginning this new consultancy practice around understanding the ethics associated with how you're using your data and how you're using your networks. And in particular, unveiling the decisions that are coded into algorithms and decision support tools. I actually think this is part of what's going to stop this discussion around uh, the privacy concerns versus the value gained in the connection of network and data. A real conversation about what is the explicit purpose that you're trying to develop, what is the public policy good that you're trying to create, and, and then work towards that as a principle. So I'm actually quite excited. I think I can see a way in through that, through the ethics discussion, and then I think the value will become clear. We'll ask the same question to Doug around, because you guys are in the business of networks and you're in the business of data and you're in the business of services. So what do you see as the link between all of those? I actually don't think the, the biggest challenge to date is, uh, is the technology. I think it's how we organize ourselves uh, strategically, culturally, structurally, and then with people in priorities to make the best use of it, whether we are the producer uh, the supplier or the consumer. Mm -hmm. And I look no further than our discussions on, um, on, on things like IoT and smart cities because uh, a, a, a complex organization such as TELUS may approach a, a city, city of Vancouver, no less complicated, uh, with, with three or four or five or more different constituencies and solutions to solve all of your problems. And you may look back at us and go, no, no, that's not our problem at all. Our problem is, um, catch basins, which I think is something we actually... That is one of our problems. Yeah. <laughs> if anybody from our engineering department is here, they'll be very happy to know that you said that. Exactly. <laughs> so uh, we, 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 um, we sometimes jam ahead from a supplier standpoint, thinking we know everything about the solution already, when really um, on the other side, the, the, like a, 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 an outside in view of, of, of starting with requirements and starting a discussion from both sides of, uh, of the table um, and, stru and st structuring ourselves to get to the solution in a like-minded way is the bigger challenge. These are traditional fiefdoms of, of, uh, of, of structure and culture and the way we organize ourselves on both sides that need to change in order to, to build solutions that matter. Yeah, I think, you, I think you really hit it on the head there. The transformation that's happening in a lot of companies and a lot of this new, new, I guess, dimension of disruption, not the traditional business model dimension, but now it's an actual modus operandi type of disruption is the typical interactions and engagements between agencies, public and private, are no longer working. They're not fast enough, they're not nimble enough, they're not agile enough, and by the time we use some of our old constructs, 
the problem has already been solved in a different way by a new generation, generation of folks, right? right. Um, interesting. So Hayden, what do you see as like the, the connection between network and data and tools and sort of agencies and, and how that's evolving? So I think what we're really looking at is how we build a, a platform from which um, really we can partner with companies. We can help try to solve solu or find solutions to government problems in a collaborative way. And I think your point is really valid around, you know, just because it's the right thing to do doesn't mean this, the pace at which you're going is going to be fast enough. Yeah. So really what we're trying to do, we're trying to use data as that connection point with the private sector, with you know, technology minds, with innovative minds, to solve some of gov government's ongoing problems that we have. Um, we see it as that, a, a perfect connection point and it's a, a pivot place around which we can work. And I think really it is from that that we can start to sort of move the metabolic rate of government to something much more fast than, than we've seen in the past. It's really interesting, you touched on, on that innovation piece. I think, Kip, a lot of what BC Hydro has done has catalyzed new innovation within the city, just the, the data that is available and the needs around that data. And there's a couple of very big recent success stories uh, that have sort of taken rise from solving some of BC Hydro's problems. So what do you think that connection is between solving the problems we have as sort of societal agencies and the connection to um, innovation and economic opportunity? Well, I think, you know, part of that is natural. Like it comes out of, out of need and opportunity. Um, you know, something like the smart meters were the first foray for us really into big data. Before then, we never saw anything like that. And that's, that is still in its infancy. We're, we're really sampling data there. We're not really streaming data. Uh, we're not doing uh, the exhaustive analytics we could. We're not combining it with other data sets. So I think opportunistically, those things will come. And in the meantime, you know, the capabilities of a lot of companies and looking at that information from a different angle, combining it with other sources of information, is going to leverage that and provide real value from it. And you know, our business is really, you know, what can we do with that information to help the customer, one way or the other, save on his energy bill or have a better experience or have fewer outages, higher reliability. But there's a whole plethora of other opportunities that can come from having that information, as you alluded to, that may spawn even new businesses as a result. Yeah. Right. So Hayden, I think you know, government is a platform. I'll talk about that for a bit. Um, these days, there's a lot of opportunity for government as a platform to to contribute to the innovation ecosystem and create opportunity. Um, can you give us ex some examples about how um, the BC government is working with technology companies to try and promote and encourage that type of uh, implementation and development of solutions to real world, world problems? And then also give us some examples of how the government is making sure that in doing so, it's not compromising our security. Sure. Uh, so there's a couple examples that we'll see around the summit this week. One of them is uh, a data visualization project that's coming up sooner. That really was taking data we have and challenging uh, private companies to help us find a solution to something that we found challenging. Another one is the, the discussion on IoT and transportation data. So we have 10,000 sensors around the province. Our Ministry of Transportation does. How can we create an analytic envi an analytics environment to solve that? So really, all of this is coming back to government using data to challenge people and find solutions with that data in different ways than we have in the past. In the past, we would go out and we would say, we have this problem, we have the solution for it, and we're going to write it down on 400 pages, and now you go and come back to us and tell us what you're going to do. Um, what we're saying instead is, here's 200 words on our challenge. Uh, how can you come back and give us something innovative in order to address this challenge? Now, we're doing that right now with sensors and things like that. I think we can start to, to play with that area with policy. Can we start to model policies and how they would be implemented in an environment? Those are the areas where I think government as a platform can really evolve going forward. I think in the end though, you know, all of our credibility is shot if we're not building privacy into the model from the front end. So we're, we're doing things like building privacy by design into everything that we do. And it needs to be at the front end. But in the end, um, the objective for us is to balance the, the sort of duty to use data with the duty to protect the privacy. 
And right now, I think we're a little bit on this side, and we need to just start to find a, ourselves in the middle of that a little bit. Mm. So, so maybe I'll ask everyone on the panel this, and we'll do another sort of down the line question. But we are privy to a lot of information at work. We we know we find out a lot about technology. Um, I have an 11 year old daughter at home, and I go home and I turn the Wi-Fi router off certain hours so that you know I know that she'll go to bed and things like that. But how does what we learn at work impact you at home? And does that does that change any of your behaviors at home, knowing? and being in this space where you have a bit of a vision into the future of, of what society looks like? Minerva, I'll start with you and then we'll go down the line. Well, I mean, I, um, from a cybersecurity perspective, I'm probably the, the most paranoid mom there is. <laughs> you know, tape over the cameras, you know, firewalls at home, um, you know, very, very important stuff. Uh, and it's this idea of cyber safety that, that you know, I think we need to inform not only our kids, but you know, people who, who live in our jurisdictions about you know the dangers of of uh, of you know cyber crime and you know. I, I find myself as like the de facto mom ringleader in our <laughs> in our group for our class is is because I'm the most connected sort of social media wise. I'm the one who puts out the sort of okay for this grade. I think this is what us moms should do. I don't know, Catherine. What about you? Do you do you bring stuff into your I think it's the exact opposite. So I have um, a 21-year-old who's in third year electrical engineering at UBC, and she's in biomedical engineering. And since she was um, online probably about eight or nine, she understood the whole issue around trolls. And I remember her being on a, um, a horse website where you, you bought a horse and you fed it or something. I think it was hosted out of France. And I said, how do you know that that person you're IMing isn't um, you know, some creepy old guy? And she goes, oh, I've reported people. And she was like nine. So mm. these digital natives, they just totally get it. So I'm incredibly optimistic that this next generation is just living in a world where they see the upside benefit. They're managing the downside risk. But somehow they're able to actually make the distinction. <laughs> that's, that's encouraging. <laughs> Doug, I'll ask you the same thing. I, I, I see so much benefit in being connected and the digital world and uh, how quickly and um, uh, how, how, how much we can improve our productivity. And yet, when people, uh, say, come to TELUS and uh, are looking for, looking for a job for a summer internship, the best advice I give them is for all our digital connectivity, um, and the same advice I have at home is, is go analog. Nothing, nothing beats a face-to-face. -face. Nothing beats human connection. Um, nothing beats shutting down at the end of it all. Uh, we, we can be connected to the hilt, but uh, the, the, the highest quality interactions come uh, w when we're face-to-face. -face. Yep. I think for me, two things. One, I'll echo the cybersecurity thing. Being CIO, that's uh, top of mind at working at home, and it gives me an appreciation at home what I should be doing. And the second one is probably just BC Hydro has such a diverse scope of work that the, the potential behind all of this IoT and analytics and big data, the whole set of buzzwords is amazing. And I think I bring that with me home to see, you know, what can we really do in that whole landscape? It's quite amazing. What, what do you think you could do if your TV's connected and your fridge is connected and your stove is connected and your iPads are connected, your phones are connected? I mean, it's going to change home life quite a bit, isn't it? Potentially. Um, so Hayden, why don't we close with you and you let me know how, how the stuff that you, you know, from your job impacts um, your behavior at home. So, well, first of all, as soon as Mark Zuckerberg had a piece of tape over his camera, I put a piece of tape over my camera. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if it's my work necessarily that drives that behavior, but I would say that um, paying attention to what others are doing certainly drives that behavior. I have a six-year-old uh, and I think for me, it's just constant conversations with him around what he's doing and how open he is to the rest of the world when he's doing that. Uh, he watches really one app, and that's YouTube Kids app. Uh, but even in that, there's a ton of advertisement. Even in that, the webcam is open. So he needs to be aware of those things. Yeah. What amazes me is, you know, when my daughter was growing up, she learned basically how to, you know, update settings at around two and a half, three, like three-ish. My 18-month-old nephew 
um, so he's a few years younger, he could do what she did at three at about 18 months. And now I've heard of kids at nine months being able to at least get into an iPad, recognize the YouTube icon, and get in at nine months. Oh. So, I mean, I imagine their frameworks are going to be a lot different. Um, thank you all for making the time to come here this afternoon. I know I'm having a great time. Um, hope everybody in the room is. And thank you so much for all of your insights today. Thanks for having us. Thanks.